Hi there. Okay, so we're into still video two of key area eight, blood glucose and obesity. This is the final key area for unit two, and we are nearly done. And this is going to be about diabetes. So some of the issues that I was talking about in the previous video about how high blood glucose can lead to vascular damage, uh, they're going to be relevant in this section here. So blood glucose has to be regulated in order to prevent vascular damage and ensure a supply of energy uh, to cells and from cells. Okay. Type 1 and type 2 diabetes cause a person to be unable to regulate their blood glucose. That's what this whole disease is characterized by. Now, type 1 diabetes, these are features you do need to know about type 1 diabetes. It usually occurs in childhood, but it can occur in adults later on. A person, per, person with type 1 diabetes can't produce insulin, Okay, so they don't produce any of it from pancreatic cells. The reason why, we'll learn in Unit 3, it's an autoimmune condition. What's happened is the body's own immune system has killed the cells that produce insulin inside the pancreas. Now, what this means is your cells can't absorb glucose and you can't store glycogen for later. So blood glucose can go really, really high, but energy levels, even though you've got lots and lots of glucose inside your blood, energy levels actually really plummet due to the fact you can't access that glucose inside your cells. OK, now the link there, you can access that if you've got access to the Sway. And it's just on a particular person who called Chandler, who talks about their experience with type 1 diabetes. Now, treatment of type 1 diabetes, and again, this is a thing you need to know, it's injections of insulin. So the idea is, remember from National 5, how we talked about in genetic engineering, that insulin can be produced using genetically engineered bacteria. So this is why it was produced. It's for diabetics. So what they do is they inject insulin depending on how much carbohydrate they have consumed, because carbohydrate will be converted to glucose in the blood, and we want to regulate that glucose in the blood. So more carbohydrate in your diet, more insulin needs to be taken by these people. Type 2 diabetes occurs mainly in overweight individuals, but it can occur in people who show binge eating habits who might be of normal or underweight. So things like one meal a day, large meals at weekends, uh, huge bags of sugar at the weekend kind of things can cause uh, type 2 diabetes. Now, this is when insulin is produced, but the liver cells do not respond, usually due to lack of insulin receptors. Okay, So that's one big difference between type 1, no insulin at all, type 2, yes, insulin, but the body's not responding to it. Blood glucose levels can go high. And again, people show a lack of energy because of lack of glycogen storage, number one. Um, and also, again, they because the um, cells don't respond properly to insulin is, again, lack of energy of insulin getting or sorry, glucose getting into cells. And again, that link there, you can access it if you've got this way. It's just a person's experience with type 2 diabetes. Now, type 2 diabetes has shown a direct link between uh, body mass index, something we'll learn about in the obesity video, so BMI, and uh, risk of type 2 diabetes. So essentially, the rule is the higher your BMI, the more you are at risk of developing type 2 diabetes. Now, treatment for type 2 diabetes, it can be treated by changing to a low carbohydrate and low fat diet. Regular exercise, exercise seems to be the cure for everything. It's a cure for cholesterol, uh, it's, it releases endorphins, as we'll learn in Unit 3, um, but it's been shown to reduce symptoms and even reverse, in some cases of people, uh, reverse the type 2 diabetes altogether. So once again, the uh, liver cells start responding normally to insulin. Now, some severe cases are treated with medication that reduces carbohydrate intake by inhibiting digestive enzymes. Now, this is quite clever. The idea is if you're absorbing too much glucose, or sorry, yeah, if you're absorbing too much glucose in your small intestine, why not block that entry pathway, meaning your blood glucose shouldn't go as high as often? Okay, but that's only in severe cases that that one's gone for. Now, general symptoms of diabetes, frequent or classic symptoms of them are things like frequent urination, excessive thirst, hunger, sudden weight loss. There are some severe symptoms of diabetes that, indicate, um, that include things like disorientation. So the person doesn't know where they are, or what they're doing. They're a bit confused, uh, dizziness, fatigue, inability to think clearly. What we find with a lot of diabetics who maybe have quite a bad hypo or hyper, we'll get into that in a second, incident is they can't think to get themselves out of the situation that they're in. So they know that they should probably either eat some sugar or take their insulin, but their brain cannot work out that connection and help them. 
Um, so again, just symptoms of hypoglycemia versus hyper. Hypoglycemia, low blood sugar. Uh, hyperglycemia, too much high blood uh, sugar. Um, and they show these particular symptoms. This is just for general interest. It's not things you could get examined on. Okay, now complications associated with diabetes. So remember in the first video how we talked about vascular damage. So the idea of high blood glucose can damage endothelium or can damage the blood vessels. This is where we're getting into it. People who from, suffer from diabetes need to make sure that they manage their condition well. Okay, now it's important to stress the things that I'm about to talk about are they occur in diabetics who do not manage their condition well. Okay, or maybe there's other genetic factors. But if you yourself are diabetic, I'm about to show you some stuff. This does not mean it's going to happen to you. It means that if your condition is not managed well, these are things that might occur. OK, so things that can it can lead to are damage to nerve cells and damage to vascular networks, or blood vessels. So let's look at the nerve damage one first. Sensory nerves allow you to be well coordinated and produce pain signals to get you out of danger. The reason why you don't fall over all the time is you've got sensory information coming from your feet to tell you how well balanced you are. Okay, chronic high blood glucose can damage these nerves. That's known as diabetic neuropathy, but you don't need to know those terms. Okay, so high blood glucose can damage these nerves. If a person with this condition then damages, cuts their foot, uh, maybe gets a bad athlete's foot infection, something like that, they might not notice because normally you look at the bottom of your feet if there is pain, if there is a problem, okay? They might not notice, infections can develop, and this is where if they really leave it for a long time, sometimes the infections get so bad that it might be that they need a foot amputation in order to prevent the infection from spreading throughout their tissues uh, and attacking their internal organs. Other thing that can happen is blood vessel damage. So let's focus on the eye here. High blood glu glucose can damage the tiny blood vessels that are in the back of your retina. So the back of your eye, the bit that is sensitive to light. So it's essentially the bit that you see with. OK, now you can see on the video, the video, the image there, I've got uh, a normal retina and then somebody who's got diabetic retinopathy. So the idea is they've had diabetic damage to their blood vessels. And you can see those darker areas indicating areas of damage. So what this problem leads to, problems with vision and eventual blindness. Other uh, blood vessel damage. So say you've got, again, you've got loads of tiny blood vessels inside your kidneys, the high blood glucose, because again, the condition isn't managed correctly, damages the tiny blood vessels in the kidney. And when these are damaged, the kidneys have trouble processing and filtering out all the stuff they're supposed to get out of your blood. And it can show physical signs of damage as well, which is not good for you and cardiovascular disease. So damage to the arteries of the cardiovascular system can increase your chance of atherosclerosis. Increased chance of atherosclerosis increases your risk of myocardial infarction, so heart attack, and stroke. Because again, you get the atheroma forming under the endothelium, narrowing the lumen, maybe leading to thrombosis, maybe leading to an embolism, traveling and blocking a brain artery or a heart artery. Now, diagnosing diabetes, you need to know some of the steps with these. So if a person goes to a GP with some of the symptoms from the previous slide, like I'm peeing a lot, I'm really tired, I've got sudden weight loss, okay? The GP will conduct tests to confirm a diagnosis. They won't instantly go, ah, yes, you have all the symptoms, I'm gonna tell you you're diabetic. They will do a proper test beforehand. Um, now, if a person has really, really high blood glucose, some of this will be removed by the kidneys and urine. It's not supposed to happen normally. So normally your pee is supposed to be glucose free. So one test you can do is clinic sticks. Clinic sticks are basically a dipstick. You dip them in pee and it tells you basically if it's got glucose in it or not. OK, uh, a very, very old test for um, diabetes used to be the person would be asked like in old and proper olden times. They'd be asked to drink their urine and see if it was maybe very slightly sweet. I don't quite understand this one because I don't think glucose is actually sweet. I think it just tastes of nothing. But um, I read it in a horrible histories book, so I'm going to say I, I'm going to say that's real. Uh, glucose tolerance test. So again, this is a way that we confirm it aside from just a clinic stick test. So the glucose tolerance test also helps to diagnose diabetes. These three steps you need to know for an exam situation. So first. The person is asked to fast for about a 12 to 24 hour period, so not to eat. OK, second, they are given a glucose drink. So it's basically just a cup full of glucose in water. 
and then third their blood glucose levels then get tested over the next two hours now a person without diabetes their blood glucose will go up and then down quite quickly as they release insulin a person who does have diabetes their blood glucose will go up and stay up because either they're not producing insulin or their liver cells aren't removing the glucose from the bloodstream like they're supposed to so this is the results that we actually see. And again, you need to know this shape of a graph. You might get asked to pick the diabetic. Maybe they've got it unlabeled and they say, here are two people who did a glucose tolerance test, which one of them is diabetic. So you notice in the type two diabetic there, blood glucose goes up and it stays high for a very long time. Whereas in the normal person, the person who is not diabetic, okay, uh, we're gonna say that the blood glucose goes up a little bit. So it goes up less. And then it also comes down really quickly and stays within that normal blood glucose concentration level. So to summarize your blood glucose problems and diabetes, one, high blood glucose damages endothelium. Diabetics show chronic high blood glucose. Type one diabetes occurs in childhood and is treated with insulin injections. Type two diabetes occurs later in life generally and is treated with diet and exercise. And a glucose tolerance test diagnoses diabetes. And we need to know the in-depth steps of that. Okay, now that's the end of the blood glucose part of it. The last video is on obesity. So we're going to be looking at BMI and a little bit of formulas um, to do with BMI calculations.